Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Mike Spertus, and I am giving a talk titled Inference, the Big Picture. So the official topic of this talk is, um, any guesses? Inference, right? So that refers to C++'s ability to infer a type or occasionally a value without the need to explicitly specify it. So, for example, there's no need to specify the template arguments when you call sort, in, as on the slide, and it goes ahead and it actually infers that you mean to call sort angle brackets vector in colon colon iterator. Um, and, in fact, people almost always call sort and infer the arguments. Obviously, there's much more to come. So inference is the official topic of this talk, but the real topic of this talk is what Bjarn Schustrup describes as generic programming should just be normal programming. And we'll talk about what those quotation marks means. So what's the connection? between those. Well, inference is what makes generic programming like normal program. So inference is what lets us call the function template sort as if it were a normal function. You look at that call to sort, and you could be calling a normal function. Or create the class template scope lock as if it were a normal class. So if you looked at this, you could be creating the class template scope lock or a class name scope lock. So inference is letting function templates and class templates um, be used as if they were normal functions and classes. So in other words, what we want to do is make template programming like normal programming. Inference is how we do that. So, um, before I talk about that in detail, I, I want to talk a little about why should generic programming be like normal programming. Um, indeed, it's a reaction you hear a lot to think that template code should be visibly different from normal code to call attention to the fact that it's template code. So. Um, this section is taken from an upcoming paper I'm writing with Bjarna. So people often think of inference primarily as a kind of convenience so that they can write code with less boilerplate, like we didn't have to specify the template parameter to sort. And in fact, the lack of repetitive boilerplate in C++ is one of the reasons we wake up every morning glad we're not Java programmers, right? So I don't want to minimize this, right? Reduction boilerplate can be very worthwhile. So for example, here's how P0429's flat map might be created with a C++14 compliant compiler. So here I have a function and it creates a flat map as a local variable. And as you can see, I have to very clearly specify many template arguments to flat map. And it's completely ridiculous because the flat map, I believe, is gluing together two existing containers. And these template arguments, it's not even legal for them to be anything else. So with the C++17 enabled compiler, you could write the same code like this. And obviously, the C++17 version gives us much less boilerplate, much better signal to noise ratio, and code that's much more like normal programming. However, I contend the notational convenience it's just a convenience. It's a side benefit of inference. Uh, the really important reason for inference 
is that it enables you to make your code less brittle and less tightly coupled, and that's transformative, right? If you come from this talk with anything, it should be that um, inferences for more than saving typing, right? So to understand this, let's think a little about what makes programs become brittle. So the idea here is programs becoming brittle means the longer you've worked with this program, the harder it becomes to modify the program. And we've all seen this in the first couple of iterations of a product. It's great and everyone's excited. And by version 10, you're lucky if you can change a font without breaking something somewhere. And the reason this happens is because the code of the application becomes tightly coupled, meaning that changing one thing requires changing many other parts of the program that are tied to what you changed. So whether to use template function and class templates or functions and classes is one of the most tightly coupled decisions you can make in programming. So the way to think of this is that C++ is two completely different models for extensibility and type generic algorithms. Normal or object-oriented programming, which uses runtime dispatch, and generic or template programming, which uses compile time dispatch. Okay, well, this is a really good thing, right? It's a strength of C++, the programmer, can choose between runtime and compile time dispatch, use object orientation for flexibility, dynamism, traditionally at least simplicity, or templates for performance. And robust support for both paradigms is an important part of why C++ is so successful, right? So the standard library uses templates almost everywhere. There's only a handful of places where the word virtual is used. So you can do much dispatch at compile time, but then there are really times where it's easier or essential to do dispatch at runtime. On the other hand, this creates a lot of problems as well, and you know, it's one of the reasons people pick on C++. So in traditional C++, template programming looks much different than normal programming. And furthermore, the programmer has to choose which paradigm to follow right from the get-go of writing their program. And the trade-offs are complicated and may change as time goes on. And once the programmers made that decision, it's virtually impossible for them to change their mind. And the inability to change your mind about decisions for which the right answer may change is what makes programs brittle, unmaintainable, and hard to evolve. So let's look at a couple of motivating examples that we'll keep in mind. So the first one is you started out in an object-oriented model, and later you decide that you really wish you were using templates. So here's some typical looking graph code, graphics code, and curve is a base class with a bunch of virtual methods in it. And especially as you start programming, you might find this easy, familiar, and comfortable to do good error messages the like, and people start using your program, and later, because performance is important in graphics, you say, I wish I'd used templates, right? That curve was a concept, not a base class, and gotten better performance. So in traditional C++, you're really stuck with that decision, but with the tools of modern C++ inference, we can evolve that decision. So we'll come back to that later, but I want you to keep that in mind for the sort of reason why you may want 
generic programming to be like normal programming. Here's another example that comes up. So you might have a function that takes a string view as an argument, and in fact, accepting a string view in this way is often recommended in modern C++ style guides. Now, what may happen at some point is um, the requirements may change, right? Someone will say, we just got our first overseas sale, and we need to work with different character types than char. Or we need to couple with J and I, and we need to use 16-bit character types, which are actually the worst, most useless character sizes because we can continue to pick on Java here, but you need to interoperate. So it's very reasonable to expect that you may wish this to work with lots of character types, not just char. So the first thing you do is you say, I'm going to change f from a function to a function template. And guess what? You broke all your client code by doing that, right? f of foo in quotes no longer works because a char const star is not a basic string view, right? f of foo s doesn't work because string is not a basic string view, and so forth. So we want to think about can we write our code in a way that's not going to require us to rewrite everything if we make a change like that. Um, but before we get to the solutions, um, right, uh, a quick question. Is everyone in this room an inference expert, knows all the C++ 20, and earlier related inferencing features. I think one person doesn't have their hand raised. Okay, you are such an expert, good. Okay, you can skip the next part. So, um, inference has come into C++ a little bit in each standard. So to understand where we are, it's really helpful to understand how we got here. So inference dates all the way back to the first C++ standard through function template argument deduction, which lets us call function templates in the same way we call regular functions without needing to specify the template arguments, like in this example. So, this is a good example of making generic programming look like normal programming. If later sort became a function using a virtual compare method, the client code will remain stable. In other words, we've abstract weighed the distinction between runtime dispatch and compile time dispatch. C11 allowed us to. Uh, apply inference to the types of variables. So by the introduction of auto in C++ 98, just your simple garden variety for loop was a lot of work to write. We all remember being annoyed that we had to type this for just every for loop. Um, C++ 11 added auto to infer the types of variables from their initializers. And here, um, the stuff between the parentheses of the simple for loop at least went from two lines to one line. But of course, complementary features were also added to C++ 11, like the range for loop, to give you the version we know and love at the bottom of the screen. C++14 um, adds generic lambdas, right? So C++14 allowed lambdas to infer their arguments, like in the top example above, where C++11 required you to um, specify the exact argument. And I want to point out, the goal of inference here is not to make your code shorter 
right? It's not boilerplate elimination, but to make it less brittle because the looser coupling enables changing the types stored in my VEC without getting an inadvertent truncation in your loop like you might have in the C++11 code. C++17 adds class template argument deduction, which has the same role with respect to object creation that function template argument deduction has to object use. So um, here's an example of locking both sides of an assignment in C++14 where you couldn't do deduction for your classes in the same code in C++17. So first, right, right, everybody in concurrency loves this feature, right? Because it saves them a lot of typing, saves them a lot of thinking, when the answer is illegal to be anything but what you put here, right? Um, and in fact, in C++17, um, scope lock was added with this feature in mind, and the code becomes even simpler and guarantees you acquire the locks without deadlock. So I want to point out this isn't just simpler, though. It makes it more easy to grow, evolve, keep your program vital forever. So C++14, not all of you may know this, had no shared mutex. It only had shared timed mutex. Uh, late in the standards process, it was found that there would be a better way to implement mutex depending on whether it's timed or not. So that was held for later. Um, so if you had C++14 code, you probably want to go change all those shared time mutexes to shared mutex, unless you're using their timing capability. And in the C++14 version, you have to change every client site. You have to change any interface. Um, whereas in the C++17 versions, the client code is robust with respect to irrelevant changes. So you've made it more loosely coupled by not depending on things that don't matter. Um, C++17 also introduced another feature called deduction guides um, for allowing you to customize deduction. These were suggested by Richard Smith originally. So the idea is C++ deduction doesn't always read your mind, right? I mean, it reads your mind a lot. A lot of people don't even think about calling sort and stuff like that, but not always. So a deduction guide lets you say, I want to do something that normally wouldn't be deduced. And an example here is you can create a vector from a pair of iterators and explain that it should deduce a vector whose value type is the value type of the iterators, right? And that would never be deduced from the constructor alone. So, C++20 um, has an inference space feature you might have heard of, concepts, right? Anybody heard of concepts? Yeah, a few more hands on that one. Okay, so th the basic idea of the concepts is that you can constrain inference, right? So um, let's consider a traditional template that um, implements Euclid's algorithm for doing greatest common divisors. So code like this is all over the place, and the person looking at that, you hope they know the programmer's intent that it needs to be only called, 
on integral types, or maybe more abstractly, um, on, um, on rings for which there's a division algorithm. Um, and, but if they don't know that, and it's not clear except by knowing it in your head, um, you'll get bad behavior of runtime or a weird error deep in the body of the algorithm. Now, okay, for GCD, which one night line algorithm, it's not that big a deal. Um, but take a look at the error you get if you make the common mistake of calling sort on a stood list, which is illegal and gives a very, very long and messy error somewhere deep in the body of the sorting algorithm, um, which means somebody who's not an extremely advanced programmer, very versed in different categories of iterators, will be stuck by an unusable error message. So um, people have recognized this needs to constrain inference for a long time, and the standard libraries provided some awkward workarounds for a while. Um, enable if t is one of these. So here's how you could write that code in, say, C++ 14 or 17, and only have it work for integral types. So this uses spin A, which is a very advanced feature in the language, you know, the coding is strange. I give an unnamed template parameter that's never used with a default value that I never make use of and things like that. But in spite of the obvious kludginess of this, um, if you look in the ACDCD19 database of common code, it's used almost 20,000 times, right? So I think this shows that this isn't just something that is a minor annoyance about C++. Lots of people are willing to go to incredible lengths to get better control of the inference of their functions. So basically, you can think of concepts is a way to constrain inference naturally within the language, like spin A does within the library. So you could rewrite that GCD function C20 this way. So just looking at the declaration makes it clear, even to a beginner, that T needs to be an integral type and that the compiler will reject any misuse of it. Now, of course, concepts has many features beyond just this one slide. Like, it might take as many as five slides to completely cover concepts. Fortunately, there are many other excellent talks at this conference that will display those five slides and maybe a few more. I'm only going to do one more, which is to mention short-form concepts. So concepts also make generic programming more like normal programming by allowing the declaration of function templates to be a lot more like the declaration of ordinary functions. So here we have two func a function f and a function template, you know, with similar conceptual meaning um, in short form concepts where Traditionally, you would have had to say template type name t, comma type name enable if is integral v of t, um, so forth. Right, so this starts to bring together the template world and the non-template programming world. Um, while C20 has a big flashy inference feature, it has, has another feature I like a lot with inference called type identity that often flies under the white radar. And interestingly, unlike everything we've done so far, its only role is to turn off inference. 
So basically, um, people, you've probably heard people saying function templates are harder to use than functions, right, or experienced it. And um, the reason is templates make code hard to work with because they are more tightly coupled to their arguments. So they're much more finicky about exactly how you call them. So a function will convert its arguments for you if there's any reasonable conversion. Um, but a function template um, requires exact matches on all of the arguments. Otherwise, it'll fail to, um, it'll fail to deduce. So here I give an example of a function f that takes a unique putter angle brackets int and an int. And I call it with a unique putter int and a char, and it's totally okay. It understands that it can convert the char to the int. But now if I change that, even with concepts, um, to a function template, and make the same call, there's a confusion because it tries to deduce from unique putter int that t is an int. And it tries to deduce from char that t is a char, so deduction fails. So first, this is brittle, changing your mind later and making your function into a function template goes and breaks a lot of your client code, and even if you did it from the beginning, you probably don't want it to be so finicky to call, because it's obvious that the unique putter that's pointing to your storage is the one that's authoritative about the real type. So, um, this is embarrassing. So the slide is missing just a little bit, so I'll just change it here which is that if I simply change this to type identity t angle brackets t, it would all work because that would tell it don't deduce from the second argument, right? It's not to be used when you're trying to figure out what T is, right? So you can think of this as a way to loosen the unnecessary tight coupling in function templates. Okay, so those are the basic features of C++ inference. It's not all of them, and they have a million tiny details. But we're interested in what is the big picture, right? So how do we want to think about inference in a coherent pattern rather than feature by feature? I don't want to say anymore, well, I like function template argument deduction, but I hate short form concepts. Or I like class template argument deduction, but type identity confuses me, stuff like that. It's just, um, as we're gonna see, using them together really enables us to achieve the vision we talked about at the beginning. So if we really want to write robust, flexible code that banishes brittleness, that makes generic programming like normal programming, we need to stop thinking about it a feature at a time, right? So the way I explain the features is not the way we want to think about them. So let's have a fun little warm up, which is, um, ranges too, and this is a nice example of what you can get when function template argument deduction, class template argument deduction, both of them constrained with concepts, work together to ensure type correct view materialization, right? So here, think of L as a range, not necessarily a list of ints. So now you do a big pipeline of range operations on L, 
And then you want to do a view materialization by storing it in a vector. Well, you can just pipe it into ranges two, angle brackets vector, and it's going to trace all the transformations through the pipeline. And finally, it will deduce based on the actual type of what's being stored, so you won't end up getting a bug because you inadvertently got to change one step in your algorithm and give you a vector of ints. Um, unfortunately, C++ 20 status of this is a little unclear because it got voted in by library evolution, but um, so did a million other things with Word and going to libraries and is in a library backlog for the CD for the wording. It is widely available in ranges implementations. So now, let's go to our motivating examples. So, as you recall, we had this example where you were writing code with curve being a base class with virtual methods, and you wrote it, and it looks reasonable, like traditional code, but since graphics programming is often very performance intensive and your competitors are calling you out on that, you say, I wish Curve were a concept. So now we're going to see how modern C++ makes it much more easy to maintain this flexibility than the way people are used to programming. So, um, one of the ideas here is we're going to want to use constrained concept notation, or short form, and that means it's much more common to have objects with no name for their types. Fortunately, since class template argument and function template argument deduction don't need explicit type names, you can make function class templates look much more like normal functions and classes. So, first, what do we do for the signature? We're going to want to change curve to be a concept, and we'll specify the concept with the kinds of operations we want it to support. Okay? Um, I have to change the argument to curve auto, right? And for the moment, we have an ugly change to the return type, which we'll come back to, but you see it uses type name and decal type and a lot of other stuff. Well, what about the body of our function f? Since f is a function template, we're going to need to infer a lot of internal calls in object creation, and this is okay as long as our uses can properly inference from them. So here's f rewritten, and it's actually simpler, clearer, better single to noise than the original code, even if you always wanted curve to be a base class. This is a better body, but it's furthermore true that you can change curve back and forth between being a base class and a concept, at least as far as f is concerned, is simply as adding or removing one auto from the signature. I hope you're getting the feeling that we're making real progress on making template programming look more like normal programming and that there's a real benefit to doing so. So, Let's try to understand what inference did for us here. So a good way to see what it's doing is write out what the body of f would look like without using function template argument deduction or class template argument deduction, except, of course, for deducing the argument c. And as you can see, here it is with all the types written out. All right. So, look, that's pretty horrible, obviously, right? So, inference inside your templates is why the body of your templates are readable and usable. 
right? So it means you don't need to litter your code with decal type for expressions without name types, right? So it's especially nice for short term concepts because we don't know what the type of C is. All we know is it meets the requirements of a curve, right? And of course, there are many, many other expressions that don't have name types because you do a function call or something. And likewise, your templates are littered with template dependent types, so you have to use te type name almost everywhere. And F actually doesn't look any better um, with the long form concept either. So you also get similar benefits from the deduction of return types as it's common in code like range pipelines. And Eric Niebler was observing to me this morning um, that each um, stage in your range algorithms being able to deduce its template arguments from the return type of the previous one is, is central to what made ranges possible, right? So all of the function templates, and then we looked at ranges too, the class templates as well. So first, we need a little reality check here, right? Is template programming always this much like normal programming? Well, we're not there yet. Let's give this talk in three or six years. So while the above example is nice, and these techniques are really, really useful. You can, can and should be using them today where you want to retain flexibility. In fact, we were lucky, or I designed it so we'd be lucky, because some code does intrinsically depend on whether we have a concept or a class. So here, if I say vector angle brackets curve of V, curve better be a class, it can't be a concept. Or if I take the address of F, ever better be a function and not a function template. So, you know, in a larger code base, it's likely that our code will have dependencies on whether we're using generic programming or object-oriented programming. So can we do better, right, because we may well want to maintain flexibility about is this going to be a compile time dispatched or runtime dispatched so we can tune it later, okay? So I have a class wrap header that um, lets you wrap a class as a concept and includes everything that inherits from it. And here are some example god bolts. Okay, the stuff on the right is really thin, but you can't see the compile options, but the basic idea is one of them, curve is a concept, the other, curve is a base class, and as we can see, our client code is fine both ways. F is fine, main is fine, and curve could be a class with a bunch of virtual functions, or curve could be a concepts with requirements that ask, say that it acts the same way. And we can flip this on a dime, benchmark it, we can tune for um, space, we can tune for speed. Um, talking with Hal Finkel about code generation in Clang where you want to compile time generate the common cases and virtually dispatch the uncommon cases. That all works, and we have another example because curve would actually probably be a class template rather than a class templatized on what kind of type you're using for your coordinates. So there's a class template wrap that does the same thing. And if you do this, look, 
you don't even need to add or remove auto anymore. You can flip between modes, tune it. You're prevented from inadvertently putting in your code anything that hardwires an assumption, whether you're using compile time dispatch or runtime dispatch, whether it's a class or a concept, a function. Um, so this, I think, is something that you can really use on a um, substantial program and tweak it. So, and retain the flexibility you need as requirements change. So here's our second example. So we, had, we have a function f that takes a string view and, you know, our boss comes out to us with the entirely unreasonable requirement that some users want a character type other than char. So what do we do this again? F tab, C tab, and concepts work together, right? So as we pointed out, you can't just change F to function template. So function template argument deduction alone doesn't do it for you. So one workaround you can do is write a lot of overloads for F so that your client code doesn't break, okay? Well, first of all, this kind of defeats the whole reason we, you got string view in the first place, which was to have a common, you know, way of working with string types. But in fact, Stood quoted from the standard library takes this approach. And as you expect, not only is it tedious, it's error prone, and it's brittle, because if string view gets a new constructor, f is silently out of date. Right, so you might say like, well, everybody would just change all their functions when that happens, but uh, we actually have an example. So um, the proposed wording for 1391 um, that makes string view constructible from a range, right, and it's gone back and forth between, you know, library and library evolution. Um, neglects to update stood quoted to take another overload, right? So, you know, brittleness is you have to update stuff everywhere manually. That's tight coupling. So what you really need is just class template argument deduction here because that'll deduce the right kind of string view from your arguments, right? So I'll write a wrapper f that calls f impl with the basic string view of its forwarded arguments. In class template argument deduction, we'll do what you want. Okay, well, are we done? Right, so this certainly let us create a function template that can take lots of different string-like types and convert them to string view where normally function templates won't convert to you. Um, but we've kind of created another problem in the process, right? Which is we've messed up overloading, which is another important C++ feature. Because if we have another function named f, I've had about 30 of them in this talk, it's going to get confused by a wrapper function. So, what we really need to do is constrain the inference so that our wrapper is only called when it's appropriate, and that's exactly what concepts do, right? So this is what we want. We have a concept that says we can construct a basic string view from it with deduced arguments, right? So now we've combine function template arguments to create a flexible function template, class template argument deduction to allow the conversions we want to take place on the arguments, and concepts to constrain it so everything is good. Okay, so good. Brittleness is dispelled, um, shows how features work together. We can even handle much more complex cases in C++ 20 
So I have some links um, to that. Um, it's not all good. It's not perfectly transparent, right? Um, you know, it doesn't work for some things, and um, there's a little bit of an annoyance between library fundamentals TS and C++17, um, basic string view lost its basic string constructor, so you still need that overload. What we really should have had is a deduction guide from basic string view to basic string, or that CTAD should have understood from the operator string view, the operator basic string view, that it should do deduction from that, and that's my bad, so. Um, I missed that, that was on me. Um, and all right, this is like an able if t, right? It's something of a kludge because the problem is inference is a work in progress and maybe one day it'll be seamless. There are good proposals addressing all of the above and my paper with Bjarna is trying to, to kind of develop like very clear, solid foundation for the roadmap to do there. But in the meantime, this is why we have best practices and useful idioms and things like that, just like we used to do with enable ift. So here's a, another example, which is to combine CTAD with type identity T, right? So if you look at PMR vector, um, it's not quite as good as what we want because if I try to construct a PMR vector from a list or a list and a PMR allocator, that's fine. C++ 20, CTAT for type aliases, for alias templates, does the right thing there, but it doesn't work if my remaining argument is just a memory resource because that's not a PMR allocator. It doesn't have that good loosely coupled function behavior of making desired conversions. So how would we fix that? Well, what we should have done, we couldn't do it because of, you know, PMR allocators older than CTAD is our C tab for alias templates, is we should have made the second argument a type identity T, and that would suppress the undesired inference, which we already know T from the type of the vector. So, uh, interestingly, this creates no breakage in API, because type identity T angle brackets T. It's just another name for T. So it may not be too late. Let's give a great example of maintaining flexibility between classes and class templates in an existing code base. So this is due from Mark Zarin at VMware. So they had a class that they used to implement finally like that, and after C++17, it was possible to rewrite that as a class template, okay? So I started to pull this up for Matt Godbolt, and he said, wait a moment, I tell people never to judge whether code is faster based on instruction counts, and then this came up, and he said, Never mind, I'm wrong. Right, that's 20 lines of code on the left and a single jump statement on the right. So, um, so anyway, um, look, could one generate similar code without this? Well, yeah, but it's usually done with a macro that has to be called in a special way. This was a transparent drop-in of a class template for a class in a large production code base, 
because class templates behave more like classes. You can do that. So this illustrates how modern inference can be used to rejuvenate a longstanding existing code base. Let's talk a little about some best practices. Um, so you've probably heard recommendations, it's in the core guidelines, to use auto for your local variables because if the type of the initializer changes and you didn't change the type of the variable, you might get something bad like a silent truncation or an undesired conversion when you meant to keep them the same. So for reasons like these, a style known as almost always auto has become popular, okay? And IDEs are doing their part to support that, so you can mouse over in Visual Studio. All right, so why aren't we done? Well, the problem is they reduce brittleness, but they add brittleness. Because just because you change the type of the variable that stored the return type of app doesn't mean the code is still right, right? So the code might assume that X is an unsigned type. So you want to constrain what's deduced to match the expectations of the code, just like in a template. So what you need to do is add a constraint, concept constraint on the auto. So it's, you have the same safeguards you have with constrained templates. So Almost always constrained auto is really superior in every way to almost always auto. So wherever you're autoing a local variable now, try to label it with what the code assumes about it. And if there's no such concept, it might be a good opportunity to create one. And the new core guidelines, this essentially what will be T12. Um, another thing to know about is there's um, a kind of odd coupling between how objects are created and where objects are created. So if I want to create an optional object O that's an optional int, I can say optional O of five, but if I want to create it on the heap, there's no way to do it, right? I can try to create a dynamic object, auto01 equals new optional of five. Well, I violated calling new and having an owning raw pointer from the core guidelines already. Still doesn't help me. I can't then say auto02 equals unique putter of, o, of o1 because unique putter doesn't deduce from a T star because it doesn't know whether it's a pointer to a T or an array of Ts. So whether you deduce objects should have nothing to do with whether you create them on the heap. Those should be independent decisions. So you can create an extra overload for make unique. Okay, I have it available online. I'm sorry, I forgot to put in the link. I'll put it there. And you can do that. Now you could say auto02 equals make unique angle brackets optional. Same for make shared and so forth. Um, another best practice is people are used to spinning their functions. You should also concept constrain your class, right? So. When you don't, you're doing a kind of withholding information and inference is worse. So, in fact, many of the deduction guides in standard library wouldn't be needed if the unordered container classes were fully concept constrained. So if you're writing a lot of deduction guides, what it's really telling you is maybe you haven't explained to the type system what your class looks like enough. So I have a nice link demonstrating what concept constraints versions of the unordered containers might look like. It's not going to happen, but this is for your own code, right? Because we have legacy compatibility issues. 
And it shows how the inference all works better. So put your constraints at the widest granularity of which they apply. Okay, we got a little notice that said, make sure for this room that you use at least 22 point type everywhere. So I want you to see that I did that. And um, this is a link um, to my CPPCon 2017 poster on class template argument deduction best practices. Um, and it won best poster for CPPCon 17. So um, hopefully they're good practices. Um, so anyway, um, what do I want you to take from this talk? Well, inference is great for getting rid of repet repetitive boilerplate, but it's much more than that, right? It reduces brittleness and tight coupling by enabling generic programming to look a lot more like normal programming so you can continue to adjust these decisions about templates or object orientation as need be. Um, inference should be looked at as a coherent whole rather than a bunch of individual features. So function template argument deduction, class template argument deduction allows you to inference your use and creation of objects and that inference should be constrained by concepts and supporting features like type identity uh, can further loosen the coupling of your interfaces by getting rid of function tem templates finickiness about their arguments, right? And improve support for inference in each successive C++ standard keeps making generic programming more like normal programming and that allows us to write clearer, better, uh, more maintainable, more evolvable code. And this is a trend we hope will continue. That's it. I have no end slide. Okay, we have literally a couple of minutes for questions. Um, let's see, so type identity T is a way to trick uh, type inference into not using that type to try to deduce. Um, do you think that that's a, a good way to do it or that if it was built into the language that there was a, a way to say, don't use this type, uh, that that would be better? Um, that's a good question. I haven't thought about it, but I will say something which is in the standards committee, we love really long, con confusing names. And the initial version, when this came up in dis discussion, it was just called non-deducible. And that would be as good as a language feature in the library. I think, I think the real problem is type identity T is, you know, it's kind of a very abstract computer science-y name that doesn't make it obvious to a beginning programmer what the purpose is. But I don't want to get in a name argument at this point. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, I, thought, I saw something interesting with your vector of curve. Yeah. Uh, and it looked like a, a heterogeneous collection of constrained types. How close or far away are we from having something like that? Right, so that's why I said you can't do that now. Um, I think there's been a lot of daydreaming about it, right? Like, could you automatically generate a proxy class? Could you do something like Boost Fusion does? But, but at this point, it's just daydreaming. I think a lot of work would need to be done. That's why I did my wrapper to say if you want to retain flexibility, which you often but not always do, you often don't want to, 
then you should do it under the constraints of a concept. So that's why I had to think to wrap a class as a concept. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you all very much.